Hi everyone, it's MJ the Fellow Actuary, and in this video, we're talking about the potential end of the world. Now, normally, I don't like to make videos on current affairs because, or well, especially with regards to financial matters, because I kind of feel like uh, I don't want to give a low resolution opinion, and there's so many things out there that one needs to consider before giving an opinion, especially someone, let's say, like me, who's did my actuarial fellowship in finance, people would expect you know my opinion to be a lot more educated. So because of that, I tend to stay away from you know the current financial news because I don't want to just give a yeah a quick opinion on something without doing the proper homework. But the current situation, because the consequences could be so severe, I thought it's it's maybe worth talking about. But of course, I do want to just throw that disclaimer out there that my my knowledge on the subject is is very limited so please do your own research and yeah i remember just chatting to my parents about it and my dad's like oh conspiracy theory and then my mom was really upset and because of course you know if you tell someone it's potentially the end of the world um they're going to react in some interesting ways and that's also one of the things that i want to do in this video is talk about how people are responding um, other people in in finance. I mean, just my LinkedIn. Uh, I posted you know this question saying, the U.S. debt ceiling um, is this the end of the world or or nothing to worry about? And after a hundred votes had come in, seventy percent were it's nothing to worry about. Fortunately, there was the thirty percent. So I'm not like completely uh, you know left field and and crazy. You know, there are thirty percent of people who are who are also thinking. Yeah, maybe maybe something is up. And of course, the the stock market hasn't reacted as much as one would anticipate it, if it was truly going to be the end of the world. Um, the yield curves of the U.S. Treasuries have have shifted. You know, especially if you compare it to some of the previous months. So the bond bond markets are starting to feel it a bit, but the the equity markets aren't. And the whole idea of if it's the end of the world. Um, both of these things should should tank to to zero because the whole concept of money is that you know it's the social technology that we use as a as a database. In fact, Elon Musk was even talking about this: how money is a is a bit of a database of recording who's added value to society um, and that kind of thing. And it's the idea is that okay, because you added value in the past, we will give you money, uh, which you can then you know redeem for value in in the future from somebody else and then that person can redeem it for other value in the future and it keeps going but money is definitely a a time sensitive instrument hence why as actuaries one of the first things we study is the time value of money because money also changes throughout time but money itself is like i say it's embedded in this whole concept of time and if it's the end of the world you know, it's the end of the, the future as we know it. Now, of course, I say end of the world. It's like, well, Michael, why if the U.S. debt ceiling, you know, crashes or, or if America defaults, why is that going to gonna end the world? You know, America is just, just one country. Um, I think in worst case scenario is if America was to, to default and not pay back, it's, it's one of the things that I, I believe is holding China back from invading Taiwan. Yes, if they invade Taiwan, the rest of the world will be like, oh, what are you doing? You know, kind of like ostracize them, like what Russia and Ukraine's happening. Also, you know, Taiwan is well fortified and it will be difficult for them militarily to, to take it on. But I think one of the big reasons why they also haven't wanted to invade Taiwan is because they own a lot of American debt and America, as a way to maybe punish China, might tell them, well, stuff you you know if you're gonna do this we're not gonna honor our, our debt obligations but if those debt obligations are not being honored because the democrats and the republicans cannot uh, reach a form of agreement um then yeah it's it just makes that a lot more likely and if china invades taiwan maybe you know, India starts going for some of the territory in the Himalayas versus China or something else starts happening and, you know, could very quickly ripple into uh, World War Three, nuclear war, uh, nuclear warfare, drone attacks. It's it just yeah, it doesn't doesn't look pretty. Um, 
So this US debt ceiling, in my opinion, can impact that. Now, one of the politicians I follow on TikTok, Jeff Jeff Jackson, I think that's his name. Uh, very cool guy. It's uh, and he was the first one who kind of like brought up that oh this is this is a problem. So I'm scrolling on TikTok, and normally I see Jeff and he's got some cool little you know things what's happening in Congress and it's and it's just interesting. And here he was a little bit panicking, like he he looked properly scared. And you know doing a little bit of of research since then coming in. Um, or not research, just reading online articles and the, the Twitter feeds of, of McCarthy and Bernie and some Republicans and some Democrats, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. There's a lot of name calling. Now, fortunately, I've done a little, did a little project for, for my own government here in, in South Africa or, or one of the other political parties. And so when I was spending time in Parliament, it was fascinating to see that once all the cameras were you know, not in place, that the political parties got on a lot better than than how they appeared. So like in South African television, uh, you know, you always see the political parties shouting at each other. And I guess that's what makes for the best news material. And probably likewise in America. But when I was there and there weren't any cameras behind the scenes, people are people and they were working and they were getting on and they were asking how each other's children were doing and it was very, all very amicable. So I can imagine probably the same happens in America that once the cameras are not on everyone's faces that they're actually are working collectively together. So there is still hope. There's, there's definitely a lot of hope in, in that sense. But this is the problem is also studying for actuarial science um, one of my specialty subjects was enterprise risk management, which was formed after the 2008 recession. And the whole idea was this thing was formed so that we would never have another, you know, giant recession like that uh, going forward. The idea was that during that recession, which interestingly enough, China kind of played a big role in it because China, in order to increase its position in the, the global economy as, as an exporter, wanted to artificially keep its currency low. And so in order to keep their currency low, they needed to sell their currency and they needed to you know, buy something else with it. And that's, this is actually how they got a lot of the American debt, that's, which is making this problem a lot more prevalent. So in order to keep their uh, Chinese currency low, the local currency low, China went out and bought a lot of American treasuries. Now, because they were buying a lot of American treasuries, they were pushing the price of those treasuries up. Once the price of the treasuries were up, as you'll know from financial maths, the yield on those treasuries starts to dip. Now, when those yields dip, it means various payments can't be made, especially if you know, you're using fixed rates, not flow chains. But before getting into all the technical, technical details and stuff, what it essentially meant is that people, well, big institutions, pension funds and big, big financial players were forced to turn to novel instruments like mortgage backed securities, because these things were a way to provide yield um, because the trusty US Treasury was getting bought too much by China. They bought it. They bought the mortgage backed securities, which had these really complicated copular models working in the background that said everything was OK. Regulators gave it the triple A stamps. And, you know, you've watched the rest of the big short movie. Of course, they all blame it on the greedy blank bankers. But there was definitely some geopolitics uh, or geopolitical investments that kind of caused this whole thing in the first place. And once again, this geopolitical investing of China is rearing its ugly head because, like I said, China owns a lot of the debt. In fact, they don't own the most. Japan, I think, owns the most because since 2018, China has been like getting rid of the debt because, of course, if it eventually does want to take over Taiwan, it doesn't want to hold, it would rather hold somebody else's debt. So, like I say, that, that Taiwan thing is... I think it's it's more a matter of when rather than than if, and this U.S. debt ceiling crisis could speed up that that timeline. Um, so, like I said, that could cause end of the world from a nuclear fallout if you know the war was to to escalate. So it's not just like oh, financial markets are going to crumble and people are going to freak out. But coming back to, to like I said, actuarial science, what we studied. So we studied the subject called it's called F one hundred and sixty in South Africa. It's called 
was called SD9 in, in England. Um, then they changed the name to, to SP9, basically Enterprise Risk Management. And the whole idea is that we learned all these complex models along with a whole bunch of other things to make sure that the world's economy never fell like this again. But there's not that many of us since, since its inception, you know, all those years ago, um, not many people have, have written this exam. And one of the things that we study a lot in this exam is this idea of systemic risk. And that was the whole thing that, you know, America had this, this viewpoint that the big banks, Lehman Brothers, these other big investment players, they were too big to fail, too big to fail. And Congress was like, well, you know what, we're not going to bail out these greedy bankers. This was the narrative. So, you know, we're not going to go ahead with the plan. These things started um, crumbling. They did start failing. The whole market went into a bit of a free fall. Congress quickly got together and then kind of kind of reacted. And it was interesting because I mean, I mean, earlier this year we we've almost had a bit of a a bit of a banking run with Silicon Valley Bank kind of you know basically collapsing and then American government coming in quickly and saying no 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 we're gonna we're gonna save the day, and when the market started to tumble that kind of put a lot of pressure on them to to act and get something done, whereas now the markets aren't reacting and that's. So the Congress or the p politicians, there's no, they can keep playing this weird game of chicken with each other because there is no pressure coming from the market for them to, to reach a deal. But in my view that this is just going to make it so that when there is the problem, there isn't going to be enough time and it's just going to make the fallout, you know, a lot, a lot worse. So like I said, that is, that's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting how the market is not, not reacting. Um, Personally, I'm thinking, you know, I do hold a lot of S&P 500. I buy into just the index funds. Um, and I'm now thinking, like normally you just buy these things and you leave them and, you know, you go on with your life. I'm at that age where, you know, putting towards savings for, for later years and all that type of thing. But now I'm, this is causing me to have a bit of an, an active involvement and maybe restructure the, the portfolio. Um, how should one restructure this portfolio? You know, I I was going in and looking at maybe some investment cars and saying maybe I should buy this or Audemars Piguet and Rolex and fancy watches. I mean, I got this, I got this cool little swatch uh, the other day, so it's not like I need something to tell the time. But maybe you know, during this uncertainty, you want a tangible asset that's not linked to you know the financial system. Um, and it's weird, like. Nietzsche's chapter that he writes in that book, Thus Spoke that Zarathustra. He's got a chapter there called Flies in the Marketplace, which really, oh, it, it, it hit home where he just challenges the entire concept of value and calls it this one big illusion. And uh, yeah, it's, it's scary because you realize the financial system. I mean, well, this is the thing. During 2008, they were talking about, oh, it's just a house of cards and now it's fallen over. And we also tend to see every 10 years or so there's a bit of like a financial crisis and you know last one was 2008 then the the 20 teens do we call it the 20 teens what do we call it the 20 whatever's of 2010 to, to 2019 like nothing really bad happened i mean yes the 2020s have been have been crazy with you know of course with covid the war in Ukraine, uh, like I say, the Silicon Valley thing, and all the crypto crashes that are happening. That's also just putting a lot of pressure on on tech stocks and and all that. So we're definitely going through a bit of a, a crazy, crazy time. And I wonder if maybe that's why the market's not reacting because it's just like, oh, we've really gone through so much. But like I say, I'm I'm very, very surprised that we're not taking this more seriously or I'm asking friends who I know work at investment companies like hey you know US debt ceiling what are your thoughts on this and they're like oh no I haven't and they're like I'll get back to you Michael I'll get back to you I haven't haven't really looked into it and I'm like what are you what are you guys doing at an investment company like isn't this but but yeah it's, it's fascinating how people aren't don't seem to be concerned with this and and, and I hope they're right I really really hope that you know the American government sorts their self out and they get this this thing in place and it's and it's good. 
um, my non-financial friends who have chatted to them about, they're like, well, why, why should why should we care in South Africa? Why should we care in South Africa if America defaults? And I'm like, because yeah, when America sneezes, the, the rest of the world gets sick. We are so integrated with them. And also, if, if America defaults on their treasury bonds, what faith are investors going to have in any other sovereign bond? People are going to start dumping bonds left, right, and center. Like it, it's literally going to test the financial system. That's why I say it's systemic. You know, if the U.S. debt ceiling. Um, well, well, this is another thing. This is another interesting aspect to it that I've been reading. This, you know, the Fourteenth Amendment, and there's the platinum coin, and it's all this talk basically saying that even if the debt ceiling isn't renewed it doesn't necessarily mean that treasury will default because there are some other options as well so and i don't know if that's just giving people a full sense of comfort or if that actually is a safety net so that hey this whole debt ceiling is just one big song and dance um it doesn't really matter at the end of the day because america can print these platinum one trillion dollar coins and say hey look we've got the money you know don't worry the debt is gone because we just created an asset which like i say it's, it's interesting because it plays straight into nisha's uh chapter of flies in the marketplace um and how value is this illusion and there we're going to see like normally when they do quantitative easing they do it at a rate and it's not in the headlines too much so people don't really know that more and more and more money is getting pumped into to the system and inflation is is eating away at that hard-earned cash that you've that you've worked so hard to to acquire um so, but if they were to go and literally print, you know, trillions of dollars on on little platinum coins, I think, yeah, more people will start waking up to this idea, like saying, "Hey, why, why is the American dollar actually so valuable? Um, if they can, you know, make a single item worth a trillion dollars, like, so there's, but that could prevent the the default from happening." It could then speed up the inflation of America, which then will also cause their interest rates to go up, which weirdly enough causes their borrowing costs to then go up, which therefore causes their def- uh, deficit to keep going up. And suddenly you find yourself in this very unfortunate death spiral, um, which, like I say, that's maybe more, it's, it's not a dramatic end of the world, nuclear bombs, we all die, you know, on, on the 2nd of June. Um, it could be more of a slow, you know, like, like, you know, like in Game of Thrones, they have like a really long winter. We could have like a really long recession where it's just doom and gloom, but we still survive. It's just miserable for the next 10 years. Um, I don't know what's worse, Armageddon or a, or a drawn out financial uh, winter. But all in all, it's, like I say, it's not looking good. Of course, tomorrow, I don't know, I could wake up tomorrow and, um, hey, turn on the news and see McCarthy and Biden shaking hands and being, hey, crisis averted. And then, you know, this video becomes very old very quickly. And it's like, oh, look at look at MJ fear-mongering us. You know, oh, MJ is so paranoid. Um, I'm hoping that's the case. Really, really, I'm hoping that's the case. And not the alternative of... People saying, why was MJ the only one who was talking about this on YouTube? Uh, where, where was everybody else, you know, pitching in and saying, hey, this is this is potentially a, a big, big issue. Because, um, yeah, it's America is in a weird state where it just keeps borrowing money. And you're like, are they ever going to repay it back? So that even that question starts now popping up. But like I say, this is just me. I mean, it's late. I should be in bed. I should be sleeping. The stuff's keeping me up. So I thought, let me just um, let me just talk to the camera. Let me talk to the camera, and uh, yeah, just just basically say some of my thoughts out loud. So I know I know it wasn't a very structured video. Uh, there wasn't a script. There wasn't a you know set guideline like let's talk about this, then that, then this. You can see it is a little bit all over the place. So feel free if I kind of went off or broke a tangent of thought and you want to know more happy to engage in in the comment section so feel free to do that but otherwise um yeah hopefully it's not the end of the world uh because there's some cool pokemon tournaments that are coming up in june that i want to go and enter and play and compete in so uh yeah hopefully the 
<laughs> the Americans don't ruin the world and um, we can go go and play in that that fun card game but until then I hope you guys are doing well I know it's exam season for for some of the students so I hope you're studying hard and not watching this video focus on your exams not on the world economy um, but for those of you who have finished and yeah keen to hear your thoughts on on this whole issue but as always thanks so much for watching keep all well, everyone and cheers